Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, if you will. Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to read the first eight verses there. Matthew 17. And beginning with verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. Uh, about a hundred yards, maybe a little over a hundred yards north of us, there's another church building. And that group is part of what's been termed the Jesus Only Movement. They deny the doctrine of the Trinity as we believe it from the scriptures. And uh, they argue that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Hence the term Jesus Only has been attached to them. Uh, in one of their denominational booklets or tracts, which I picked up years ago, they say that when you believe on Christ, that is your part in salvation. When you are baptized in water in the name of Jesus only, that's the minister's part. And when you begin to speak in other tongues or with other tongues, that's God's part. And all three of those things are essential to be saved or to prove that you're saved. Without any one of those, then they consider you to be unsaved still. And um, sometimes you'll see a bumper sticker, and I've seen it many times. It says, um, be baptized according to Acts 2.38. And that's one of their campaign slogans is uh, salvation according to Acts 2.38. Uh, but if you give to man, or you assume to yourself some equal part to play in your salvation as you give to God, that becomes unscriptural. I'm not the one that does any of the work or the saving. All I can do is the trusting. God is the one that does the saving. Your preacher, your church doesn't save you. Being baptized doesn't save you. But they would question our salvation because we don't believe those things. We question their salvation because they do. And uh, they represent what's called the Jesus only movement. Now, I'll, I tell you all that because I, I've called this sermon Jesus only based on verse 8. But I don't want you to confuse me with them this morning. In our text, the Lord Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him up into a mountain apart from the other disciples. Luke's account of this in Luke 9, verse 28, tells us the purpose. It says there, He took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. That was the purpose of taking them apart. How would you like to be uh, invited by Jesus Christ to go to a prayer meeting with Him? Just the two of you. Riding in the car, having conversation. <laughs> I don't know if you're riding in the car, but... But uh, every believer should want to have some sort of closeness and intimacy with the Lord that maybe not all Christians are entitled to. The Bible says the Lord walked through the garden in the cool of the day, uh, seeking Adam and saying, where art thou? There in Genesis chapter 3. And I, I uh, refer to that verse because anytime God wants to be with you, it's cool. 
a loose way of using the scriptures. D.L. Moody said that sometimes in the middle of the day, he would be overcome by the presence of God, as though God wanted to converse with Moody, or to have fellowship with Moody. And Moody would have to beg God to hold, withhold himself long enough for Moody to be alone and get in private and just pray to the Lord and enjoy the fellowship of God at that moment. God wanted fellowship. God wanted to pour himself out onto Moody right at that time. And the Son of God took Peter, James, and John apart to show them something special. Evidently, they were prepared for it in a way that the other apostles were not prepared for it. Peter writes about this later in 2 Peter 1, verses 17 and 18. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But you and I should be prepared for any sort of out-of-this-world experience God might want to send to us. Ask God for it. Believe God for it. Um, be prayed up and read up and studied up and think that God wouldn't deny you some special blessing. Um, there's no reason you and I shouldn't also enjoy that kind of intimacy with God. But I call this sermon Jesus Only. And uh, first of all, let me say this, point number one, we should worship no man save Jesus only. Being God in human form means that he's the only man worthy to receive uh, the worship of other men. We read that King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 46. And yet Daniel never stopped Nebuchadnezzar from those actions. He never stopped him and corrected him uh, for doing so. Daniel requests from the king uh, some favor from his, for his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, that they should be promoted over the affairs of Babylon, which they were. And, um, well, Daniel was getting closer with the king. And then in Daniel chapter 3, when his friends are cast into a fiery furnace for not bowing to the image of the king, Daniel was nowhere to be found. He was nowhere to be found in that story. Later, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Now his son Belshazzar comes to the throne. And he wants to shower Daniel with gifts if he will interpret a vision for him, some dream that he had. But Daniel replied, Let thy gifts be to thyself. Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation, Daniel 5, 17. Mortal men are not to be worshipped. Evidently, God had some way of correcting Daniel's mistake by the time Belshazzar came along. And Daniel understood this now, that he's not worthy to be worshipped. Only God is. The Bible predicts that there will one day come into this world a king who will sit upon the throne of Israel in Jerusalem. And the nations of the world will go up to Jerusalem every year to worship the king seated upon his throne. Zechariah 14, 16. When the wise men came to Jerusalem, they asked Herod, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Matthew 2, verse 2. And then Matthew 2, verse 3 says, When Herod the king heard, had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. He was a king, but he was a man of flesh and blood. He was seated upon a throne in Jerusalem, but nobody mistook him for a deity. Nobody wanted to worship Herod the way that these wise men sought out Christ to worship him. And um, Herod wasn't worthy of it. But there was a young boy, there was a young toddler out there somewhere who was indeed worthy of their worship. And uh, Herod had to find and seek out and search out that baby, hoping to destroy him so he wouldn't pose a threat to Herod's rule uh, on the throne. The Bible says, and as Peter was coming in, 
Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. Acts 10, verses 25 and 26. The Bible says the people of Lystra tried to worship Paul and Barnabas, saying, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Acts 14, verse 11. But they said to the people, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth, and the sea and all things that are therein. Acts 14, 15. John writes about the heavenly messenger, uh, speaking to him, Revelation 19, verse 10. He says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. No man, no earthly mortal man, is worthy to be worshipped except the only one who was manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16 In the Bible, we read about many people who worship Jesus Christ in his flesh. The leper he healed, Matthew 8, verse 2, came and worshipped Christ. The ruler of the synagogue worshipped Christ after Christ had healed his daughter, Matthew 9, 18. Peter, walking on the water, when he sank and Christ rescued him, Matthew chapter 14, and uh, the others witnessing it all worshipped Christ. The Canaanite woman who had the sick daughter and Christ healed her, Worship Christ, Matthew 15, verse 25. James and John's mother came worshiping Jesus, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. There's a demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5 who Christ healed. Mark chapter 5, verse 6, who the Bible says worshiped Christ. There was a blind man Jesus healed. Uh, they kicked him out of the synagogue, John chapter 9, verse 38. Uh, he worshiped Jesus Christ. The disciples who first saw him alive again after his resurrection worshipped him, Matthew 28, verse 9. And all the disciples, when they saw him ascend into heaven, also worshipped him, Luke 24, verse 52. And Jesus never stopped any single one of them from worshipping him, because he was worthy of it. No man is worthy to be worshipped. Um, to elevate a man to the level of deity... Is, uh, there's a word for that. It's called an apotheosis. And I read that in a book years ago about the way that uh, so-called Saint Anthony was elevated almost to the level of deity in um, uh, Catholic uh, tradition. And um, so I went to the dictionary to find out what does that word mean? And, and apotheosis means to elevate someone, mortal man or woman, almost to the level of deity. And this is what sickened me the last week and a half over much of Billy Graham's funeral preparations is how much people were elevating him and his legacy and his ministry almost to the level of uh, deity. And for too long, modern Christians have um, thought of Billy Graham as though he were the, uh, the Pope of evangelical Christians. And uh, he wasn't. Uh, nor do we need a pope. But they would seek him out as though he were the final authority in everything. They'd want him to read their books and write a foreword to it and uh, write a nice review of it. They'd want to be seen with him or to say that they had had some contact with him. And the uh, strangest thing, um, over my lifetime, you, you know, I would see Billy Graham on a talk show or some program, some interview program, and uh, at least twice I heard him say, my wife has always been a much better theologian than I am. But nobody was seeking his wife to read their books because they weren't getting the accolades that he was getting in public. But the idea that we elevate somebody to such an authority that we need their stamp of approval on what we're going to do uh, is uh, really sickening. It's really sickening to elevate someone to that level. Now, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to deny the blessings that God sent into the world by Billy Graham. 
and uh, nor should we. Uh, there were multitudes saved under his ministry in countries all around the world. And I wouldn't want to take away from them. God used him as a great evangelist, one with the most, with the best access to the most tools of, of uh, communication than any great evangelist before him. <coughs> but the way he was elevated was very, uh, been very disheartening. But of who else could it be said in the scriptures, he is the son of God. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the bread which came down from heaven. He is the true vine. He's the day spring from on high. He is the alpha and the omega. The prince, he's the prince of life. He is the I am. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Of who else could it be said except the Lord Jesus Christ? Men have always been prone to worship other men and to make gods out of someone else who's just like them. Franklin Graham, in his eulogy of his father the other day, said um, his father was welcomed into heaven and saw the throne of God and you know, bells ringing and trumpets blowing, angels rejoicing. And then he was very careful to say, not because it was Billy Graham, but he was just another Christian coming home. And I'm glad he said that. I'm glad he added that little... Um, clarification. But to worship another man, it feeds your ego uh, because it tells you that maybe I can become like him because he was just like me at one time. This is the Mormon sense of God. One of the Mormon prophets said, as a man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. That's through good works, uh, good effort, good deeds, and obedience to their church. The Tibetan Buddhists consider the Dalai Lama to be a living God. And uh, I've never heard of him casting out devils. I've never heard of him causing the deaf to hear, or opening blind eyes, or raising cripples to their feet. He's only a man. He enjoys the attention of uh, the media, but he's no God. Modern doubters, they want to strip the deity from Jesus Christ, pretend that he was only another man. He was a sinner like them. I had a man who was a retired, who was a retired uh, Protestant minister tell me that Jesus committed sins. And I got so angry talking to him because he knew I was a preacher. <coughs> and uh, I said, well, give me an example. Of course, you put him on the spot, they can never give you an example. And I said, you're pathetic. And this man was in his early 80s at the time. And he said, I, could take, I, I told him, I could take all your Bible knowledge and put it into a thimble. I still have room for my elbow. And I walked out of the room. And sometime later, I apologized to him. And then he apologized to me. But uh, didn't change the fact that he believes that. He's still lost and unsaved. But we can say, just as Peter did, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we know it by his word. We know it by the experience we have and the fellowship we have with him. But we should worship no man save Jesus only. Secondly, let me say, we should preach no man save Jesus only. Uh, according to Matthew 28, Mark 16, you and I are charged to preach the gospel, baptize those who believe it, and then teach them to obey Jesus Christ. That's where to preach Christ, let Christ save them, and then teach them how to follow Jesus Christ. Paul said, we preach Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1.23. Some may say that too much time is spent talking about the, the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, the gospel of salvation, and not enough time is devoted to uh, prophecy, not enough time is devoted to tithing, not enough time is devoted to all these other things and um, feeding the hungry and fighting poverty in the world or getting involved in some social cause to stop uh, abortion and a number of things to which you and I would have to say the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1.18 when someone thinks the, the gospel of salvation, the cross, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, his 
burial, his resurrection, uh, is a minor or a trivial matter. These other things are more important. They're more pressing. They're more urgent upon the life of a Christian. That person's lost. That person's unsaved because they don't appreciate the importance of that message. And, uh, and I'll say this about Billy Graham. He was right when he would preach that the simplicity of the gospel is still the most important message every person needs to hear. No matter where they live, no matter what country they're from, no matter what language they speak. But our first concern needs to be to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, Romans 1.16. The Bible tells about the disciples, Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It says, daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Preaching the words and the ideas and the writings and the philosophies of famous men who were only men is not sufficient. Preaching the positions and beliefs of, a, of a, a religion or a church denomination is not enough. Preaching the importance of the right church membership, the right ordinance, the right sacrament, like the Lord's Supper or communion as it's often called, or water baptism in some form, that will do nothing to save a lost soul. You cannot affect a deep spiritual change by some outward gesture. You think that'd be self-evident to somebody who wants to learn about spiritual things, but you cannot affect some spiritual change in the heart, in the soul, by some physical gesture, by prostrating yourself or bending down on a knee or bowing forward or laying on your back or laying face down or any other action. That cannot affect some spiritual change. Only God can do that. Paul writes in Colossians 1.16, for by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus is the preeminent one in this universe, and he deserves to be preached about that way. When, um, and I, I, told, I told you recently, I've been working on a book uh, called the Bible Believer's Guide to Buddhism. And God willing, I'll be able to finish it uh, before this year is done <laughs> and maybe get that to print. But there have been a number of books trying to equate uh, the words or the sayings of Jesus with the sayings of the Buddha. The Dalai Lama wrote one, another Vietnamese monk wrote one, wrote, wrote a couple, and then a couple of uh, European and American writers have done much the same. But the truth is, no such equivalency can be made. Jesus Christ has no rivals. He has no competitors. He's so far above all the rest. The Bible says at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's going to happen someday. John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John 3, verse 30. Uh, the three disciples... Peter, James, and John, they saw Moses and Elijah there with Jesus. But when Peter proposed building three tabernacles, he didn't understand that Christ was far above the Old Testament prophets. He was so far above uh, Moses and Elijah. And it would be out of place for any mortal man to receive the honor due to Christ alone. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, Exodus 34, it says... When Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Exodus 34, verse 30. But Moses was merely reflecting the glory of God as it had been displayed to him. And um, Jesus is transfigured with his disciples to show them his own glory and a glimpse of his future splendor. It was a, this whole, that whole section, Matthew 17, is a foreshadow. It's a glimpse of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Moses and Elijah are prophesied to appear uh, as two witnesses before Jesus Christ comes. And so this was a glimpse, a foretaste, a foreshadow of the coming again of Jesus Christ and his future glory. So we have to admit we worship no man 
save Jesus only. No man save Jesus only. We should preach no man save Jesus only. And thirdly, let me say, we should look to no man for salvation. Save Jesus only. Nobody else can save. You would think it would be self-evident that only the Savior can save. And yet people depend on all kinds of things to get the job done, which, which they can never do. They're looking to their church membership. They're looking to their friends. They're looking to psychology. They're looking to uh, alcohol or drugs to give them some sense of satisfaction or relief from their problems. They're looking to a host of other things to feel the emptiness in their heart, and nothing can do it except Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6 tell us, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Christ bridges the gap or the gulf between a holy God on one side and sinful man on the other. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 tells us that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Isaiah 59, verse 2, says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The Lord can hear you, but until you resolve the, the problem of sin between you and God, he's under no obligation to hear. He may hear, but he's under no obligation to respond until you've made things right with him regarding your sin problem. Simon Peter wrote that Jesus... Uh, wrote about the Lord Jesus saying, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 22. He preached in the book of Acts how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Acts 10, verse 38. And he says about him later, for Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18. 3, uh, Jesus Christ was born into the world as a man. He grew up like any other uh, flesh and blood child with young man would grow up. He walked among men. He lived among men. He can identify with men and can identify with the weaknesses of the human flesh. And yet succeeded in living his entire life without sin. No sin in thought, no sin in word, no sin in deed or actions. Therefore, he was qualified to die as a substitute for the sinner because he had no sins of his own that needed to be forgiven. He took the place of guilty sinners before a holy God in his judgment. Paul wrote, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 5.21 If you're in Jesus Christ, you now possess the righteousness of God that God can accept when he looks at you. He no longer sees you uh, covered in the guilt and the sin, uh, the, uh, the shame of your own sin. He now sees you covered with the perfect virtue and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's a matter of faith. It's a transaction that takes place between you and God by faith. No other man ever earned that for you. No other man could offer it to you, save Jesus only. No religious figure, uh, no religious person in history could do that, could do for you what only Jesus Christ could do for your sake on the cross of Calvary. And now his invitation is for all men to trust him and trust him alone. Uh, men need to stop trusting other things. They need to stop trusting organized religion. They need to stop trusting the opinions of other people. They need to stop trusting the views of their friends or their, their so-called friends on Facebook who they've never met and they're never going to meet, but he's my friend anyway, right? They need to stop trusting what someone on television tells them. They need to stop trusting popular books by so-called Christian authors uh, unless that author is leading you back to trusting the simple gospel of Jesus Christ alone. That person's misleading you. 
John wrote, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 we should worship no man save Jesus only. We should preach no man save Jesus only. And we should look to no man save Jesus only. 